Matthew 4.19, Jesus called out, Come along with me, and I will show you how to fish for the souls of men. And so we're going to talk through Jesus' strategy uh, of fishing for men, from Matthew chapter 10, Luke chapter 10. So on your notes, number one, you need to know what you are fishing for. Uh, if you're going to go fishing, you have to know what kind of fish uh, you're going to be fishing for because there are different types of methods for fishing. There are different types of equipment. There are different types of hooks. There are different types of bait. I mean, you know, you have to do different things in order to catch different types of fish in different types of fish environments. And so you've got to identify uh, who is your target. Now, I want to say right up front, when we, when we talk about identifying a target, we are not talking about being exclusive. You know, the first pushback I get whenever I talk about a, a determining a target for your church is, well, we want to reach everybody. We want to reach everybody. Well, if you go out and try and catch every fish, more than likely you will catch no fish. Okay? So it's not a matter that we're saying, oh, we don't want to catch these people, we don't want to catch these people, we don't want to reach these people. No, it's, it's not being exclusive, it's being effective. And I found in my own church that the more I got focused on reaching my target, the more effective I became at reaching those people, the more different types of people that I caught. Because as you reach a certain person, as you reach, identify who the target is that you're trying to reach in your community, they know people. They know people older than them. They know people younger than them. They know people more different than them. And so they'll begin to bring them, and, and you'll have... My church is very diverse. Uh, it's very diverse in age. It's very diverse in income. It's very diverse in race. It's very diverse in background. It's very diverse in professions. But we've reached all of those different people because we very strategically identified the target that we wanted to reach. And then we let that target broaden who, uh, who we brought, in, brought into the church. So it's, uh, we'll, we'll walk through and, you, and you'll see how this plays out. But as you look at, in the Bible, Jesus had a specific evangelistic target. Matthew 15, he says, I was sent only to the lost sheep of Israel. Uh, Paul and Peter both had a specific evangelistic target. In Galatians 2, 7, Paul says, I was entrusted with the task of preaching the gospel to the Gentiles, just as Peter had been given the task of preaching the gospel to the Jews. And the disciples were given a specific evangelistic target. In Matthew 10, he says, Don't go among the Gentiles or enter any town of the Samaritans. Go rather to the lost sheep of Israel. And so there is, there's a power that comes when you um, uh, focus and seek to reach a, a, a certain type of people. The, you know, none of us are good at everything. None of us are good at, at connecting with every uh, type of person. And so, but we can become good at reaching the people that we can reach, and then they in turn can reach, can reach other people. So there's a real power in defining your evangelistic target. So how do you do this? Well, number one, you need to ask how many people live uh, in your area. You define your target geographically. And I'd encourage you to determine where is our church going to meet and then draw a circle uh, of uh, one, three, five miles. It says miles here. You can do kilometers. It works the same. But you identify uh, rings of distance away from your church. I'd encourage you to think how many people live within walking distance of the church, how many people live within taxi distance of the church? How many people live on bus routes and can come to our church or on a metro? Or you know, Look at how people will come and determine how many people live within uh, those ranges. And then you figure out the, the number of people uh, there, the average trip time. And then uh, in America, you can figure that 50% of them don't go to church. Your numbers may be very higher than that. Uh, or you may be in an area where there are lots and lots of Christians. Okay? But you want to understand, what, what are we reaching and how many of them are not connected with the church? And that identifies your target geographically. That's your fishing pond. That's the area that you're going to try and fish in. Number two, you want to ask, what kind of people live in our area? This is my pond. What kind of fish are in it? 
And so you define your target demographically. And you ask yourself, what's the age breakdown here? You know, how many in each, each age group? Is this mostly middle age or is it mostly college age students? Is it mostly older people? Uh, are most of the people that live in our area children because there are lots of young families? You want to identify what's the age breakdown. Uh, you want to look at what the marital breakdown is. How many uh, people are single? How many people are married? Because the way you reach married people is different than the way you reach single people. Uh, you want to look at the income breakdown. What do they earn? Now, in, in almost any neighborhood, certainly in my, uh, my area, you've got a wide range of people and, and how much they make. We've got poor people in, in, within the sphere of influence of my church, and we have wealthy people and everybody in between. But also in neighborhoods, you can identify what, what is the percentage, what's the the majority, and, and identify who are the people that you're going to, to try and reach. And then you look at occupational breakdown. Where do they work? Are they blue collar? Are they white collar? Are they laborers? Are they professionals? Are they stay-at-home moms? You know, what, what, what's the primary occupation of the people that live in your area? Now, you can find this information, uh, usually your government uh, census, uh, the local library, uh, your, um, uh, we call them counties and cities, have a lot of demographic information on your local area, newspaper offices, uh, you know, realtor groups. Uh, you, you can dig a little bit and find uh, pretty s uh, significantly researched information about your community and about the breakdown. That's one of the wonders of our age. You can do some little Google searches in your area and start coming up with some of the demographic uh, information. Uh, another way to do that is just to go outside and look around. You know, just go out and pay attention to, to what you see and, and who's here and, and, and have eyes to see, uh, you know, all the different levels, all the different groups, and, uh, and pay attention to your area. Uh, number three, you want to ask what are their values, their interests, and their fears? And this is how you define your target culturally. Uh, you want to know, what, what are they interested in? What are their hobbies? What are they afraid of? Uh, what do they value? And, uh, and you can tell that just by kind of, again, looking around in the community. What are the activities that are people, people are involved in? And uh, what uh, kind of shops are there? What kind of uh, workplaces are there? That will identify uh, uh, kind of the, the uh, cultural uh, standing of your, of your community. But really, the, the best source for this is if you can uh, do a personal a community survey. If you can just get out and talk to people. And I'd encourage you, as you do that, Pastor, don't make this uh, a, a, a witnessing opportunity. Don't make this where you are going door to door to share the gospel. Make this an opportunity where you're going door to door to glean information. Uh, for one thing, it, it takes a lot of the... Um, uh, negativity or, or resistance to it from other people. You're just having conversations. You're just getting to know the people in your neighborhood. You're just finding out for them uh, uh, who they are and where they work and what, what are they interested in. What do they do for um, uh, recreation? What do they do uh, to entertain themselves? What are their fears? What are their needs? And so you want to uh, just try and pay attention within your community. And then you want to try and determine what do they know about the gospel. And this is how you target your uh, 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 area, you target your community uh, spiritually. And so you determine their, their religious background. Uh, you know, is it, is it Muslim? Is it Hindu? Is it atheist? Is it, uh, you know, Buddhist? Is it, um, you know, whatever? Or is it Christian? What, you know, is there a heavy Catholic influence there? Or, you know, what... What is, the, uh, is the, re the religious background? And the truth is, all unbelievers are not alike. Uh, unbelievers are very, very different. And so we want to spend the time, put forth the energy, to try and identify, well, who are the people that, that uh, we're going to reach in our neighborhood? And then you want to personalize uh, your target. You want to think it through, and you want to come up with a, a description of what does your target look like. Um, we actually, uh, at, at Saddleback, they had called him Saddleback Sam. And they had identified some characteristics about 
uh, about him. Who was the typical uh, uh, guy that lived in their neighborhood? Uh, for us, the, the neighborhood that we are in is called Belton. And that's the, the name of the town is Belton. And so we named our target Belton Bob. And we came up with uh, 10 questions that we asked uh, about the person in our community. And based off those answers, we determined uh, who it was that we could reach. And uh, so let me give you some questions to ask. This isn't in your notes. This is free. So if you want to just write these down, 10 questions you can ask about the people in your community. Number one, is, uh, is he married or single? And number two, does he have children or not? And if so, how old are they? Uh, what's his education level? What's his occupation level? Is he a business owner? Does he work in a business? Is he a laborer? Is he a professional? You want to ask, do, uh, what kind of setting does he like? Does he like a casual setting? Or does he like things to be more structured and to be more uh, uh, cultured? What are his deep desires? What does he really want out of life? Number seven is what's his uh, financial situation? Is he overloaded with debt? Is he comfortable? Does he have great financial needs? Does he have wealth? Where's he at financially? What kind of atmosphere does he like when he goes to an event? In other words, when he goes out to eat at a restaurant, when he goes to some sort of an event, what's he looking for? Does he want something that is, is fun and uplifting? Does he want something that's intellectually challenging? Does he want something that's active and, and uh, more like a party? You know, what, what kind of a setting does he like? Another question you can ask is, uh, does he like to entertain people in his home? Does he like to go to other people's homes? Or is there a, kind of a barrier or a, 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 a wall around the home? And then how does he feel about his station in life? In other words, is he satisfied with his job? Is he satisfied with his house? Is he satisfied with what's happening? Or is he dissatisfied and have, have real yearning? And so we took a look at our community and we determined that Belton Bob, he's married, he has young children, he has some college, some vocational training, He's either a middle manager or he owns his own small business. He likes a casual setting. He doesn't want to come into a really fancy building. He'd rather be in a casual environment. Uh, he longs to be a good parent. He's concerned about raising his children. He's overloaded with debt. He, he owes more than he makes. He's stressed out when it comes to money. And he likes things to be uplifting. He likes to do things that are exciting and fun and refreshing. In our neighborhood, people love to have people into their homes. Uh, most people have, have a home, they have a backyard, they have a patio, they like to cook out, barbecue, they like to feed people, they like to interact in their homes. And finally, he doesn't like his job. There's just some real dissatisfaction with his job and with his work. And so as we begin to understand these things about him, now we understand what kind of a worship environment we need to create that's attractive to him because the goal is to reach out into our community through evangelism and attract a crowd to worship. And so this understanding helps us to know what kind of sermons do we need to preach? What topics, how do we need to preach them? What topics should they include? What kind of worship do we want to have? 
Are people going to dress up to come to church, or are they going to want a casual atmosphere? Are they going to bring children with them when they come to church? How important is our children's ministry? And so the understanding who it is we're trying to reach uh, really helps us to create an environment in the church that's effective at reaching them. So you want to personalize your target. Again, you love everybody, you share the gospel with everybody, but you, you have an idea in your mind, this is the person that we're, that we're trying to reach. Number two, you want to learn to think like a fish. In Matthew 9, 4, Jesus knew what they were thinking. Uh, when he sent out uh, the, the evangelists in Matthew 10, he said, I'm sending you out like sheep among wolves, therefore be as wise as serpents and as harmless as doves. In other words, Jesus is saying, you need to understand the people that you're going to, uh, to reach. You need to uh, be wise in the way that you act toward those who are not believers. Uh, unfortunately, in our day, the average um, uh, restaurant manager understands his community better than the average pastor. Because uh, he, he knows what their needs are, what their wants are, what kind of environment they like. And, and most pastors uh, haven't even thought that through. And the problem is, is that the longer I'm a believer, the less I think like an unbeliever. The more I think, and, and if you're a pastor, now you're two generations away from thinking like an unbeliever. You're not only thinking like a believer, you're thinking like a pastor. And so as much as possible, you've got to find out uh, what, what are the people thinking about? What's their perception? And the best way to discover the mindset of unbelievers is to talk to them. Talk to them. If you don't ask the right questions, you won't get the right answers. If you don't get the right answers, you won't develop the right strategy. If you don't develop the right strategy, you won't get the right results. And so you want to you want to connect with the unbelievers in your community and talk to them. A Saddleback began with a personal opinion poll. Pastor Rick actually went to over 25,000 homes in his uh, in his city and knocked on the door and asked them uh, these questions. He said, are you currently active in a local church? If they said, yes, we go to church, he said, thank you very much, and he moved on, because he wasn't interested in the opinion of church people, he was interested in the opinions of people who weren't going to church. If they said, no, we don't go to any church, then he said, what do you feel is the greatest need in this area? And if you ask people you ask what they them, think, what's your greatest need, You've just safely asked them, what do you think is the greatest need in the area? He says, why do you think most people don't attend church? And again, you're not asking them, why don't you go to church? You know, that's kind of a, an intrusive, uh, aggressive question. But if you ask someone, why do you think other people don't go to church? Well, that's a safe question to answer. And what are they going to tell you? Well, they'll tell you why they don't go to church. Okay? So you found that out in a very safe way. And then you say, well, if you were looking for a church, what kind of things would you look for? So in other words, what, what, what would entice you, what would encourage you uh, to come to church? And then what advice would you give me? How can I help you? If I'm, if I'm the pastor in a church in your area, how, how can I help you? And what, what Rick discovered was that there were four common reasons why people avoided church in his area. First, they thought that the sermons were boring and irrelevant to my life. No one wanted to go to church and hear a, a, a 40-minute sermon on something that didn't matter to them at all. You know, so they're not interested in the sermons. So the members are unfriendly to new attenders. You know, when they show up at church, they feel out of place. They feel like they don't belong. They feel like they're the outcast. Said there's too much emphasis on your money. You show up at church, and everything's about the money. The pastor talks about how much money we need, how we're going to raise the money, how much the building costs, how much the, uh, all the ministry costs, and there's just too much talk about money. And, and that makes unchurched people uh, uh, feel uncomfortable. And then the children's programs and the ch child care are weak. Uh, people were, were nervous about placing their children in, into a nursery, nervous about putting their children into a children's ministry because they didn't think that it was up to their standards. And so what Rick learned as he did this is that most unchurched people are not atheists. They're just turned off by the church or they're too busy to go to church. 
And so it's a matter of uh, many times it's not the gospel that is uh, keeping people from going to church. It's the culture of the church. It's the, the, the uh, atmosphere of the church, the image of the church that is causing people not to, not to want to come. So Pastor Rick took that information, he wrote a letter, and he mailed this letter out to uh, uh, all the people in the area where he was trying uh, to start his church. And uh, you've got a copy of the letter there, and basically it just says, at last, a new church for those who've given up on traditional church services. Let's face it, many people aren't active in church these days. Why? And then he just listed all the reasons that he'd gotten from his survey. Why, you know, why don't people go to church? Sermons are boring, don't relate to daily living, churches are more interested in your wallet, members are unfriendly, and you wonder about the nursery. And then he, he said, we've got good news for you, we're creating a church that answers all of those, uh, those problems. Uh, we've got a new church designed to meet your needs, and we're a group of friendly people who've discovered the joy of the Christian lifestyle. And so at Saddleback Church, you'll meet new friends and get to know your neighbors, enjoy exciting music with a contemporary flavor, hear positive, practical messages which uplift you each week, trust your children to the care of dedicated nursery workers. And then he positioned himself with, with this statement. He says, why not get a lift instead of a letdown this Sunday? You know, why not come to something positive and uplifting rather than go someplace where it's a, a disappointment? And then he invited them to come to, uh, to their first service. Uh, when we started my church, uh, we're actually located in the center of the United States. Saddleback is way over on the Pacific Ocean coast, the west coast, and we're located right in the center. We call it the heart of America. That's the area that I'm from. And uh, we're in a, a fairly large city and uh, several million people, and we're in a suburb on the edge of that. And, uh, and so when, uh, when we launched our church, we wanted to identify who, uh, who is our target, and we recognized that there were many of these same things that Pastor Rick had found. And so we ran ads in the newspaper, and we did some mailings out to people and uh, told them that, look, we're starting a church, uh, casual dress, you don't have to dress up, don't have to wear a tie, because that was very important to the people in our community. They wanted to be casual. Many of them, uh, if, if, they, um, if they worked in the, the trades or in construction, which a lot of our people do, they don't have a suit and a tie to wear to church. And they didn't want to have to go buy a set of clothes just to wear to church. We also had a number of professional people, and they were wearing suits and ties to work all week, so they were tired on Sunday. They didn't want to get put on that suit and tie again. They wanted to be able to come casually. So that was a very important value for us. And then we identified that we're going to have relevant messages that address issues in your life. Uh, we're going to um, have uh, contemporary music with a, uh, with a live band. That was a very high value for people in our community. They wanted uplifting, fun music. And then we said we have uh, a children's ministry that your kids are going to love. And so you want to uh, find out what your target looks like, what their needs are, and then you position your church as being the, the solution, being the ones who can meet those needs. And then number three, if you're going to fish uh, like Jesus, you've got to go where the fish are biting. You've got to go where the fish are biting. If a home or town refuses to welcome you or listen to you, leave that place and shake the dust off your feet. Because some people, some neighborhoods are more ready to receive uh, Christ than others are. And, uh, and you want to find those receptive people. Uh, I planted my church in 1997, so 20, over 22 years ago. But prior to the church I'm pastoring now, uh, I tried to plant a church in another location, in another city. And I actually spent two years there and could never get the church above 30 people. And I, I'd researched it. I matched the community. The community matched me. There weren't a lot of churches in that area. It just seemed like a, a good place to go and plant a church. I honestly sought the Lord's uh, direction and felt he was leading us there. But we spent two years there and just could not get the church, get the church going. And I finally came to the conclusion, God, the, these people, they're just not ready. They're not receptive yet. We've reached some, but we can't reach any more. And so I made the decision and moved my family from there to a whole, a whole other city, about uh, 
three, four hours away and started uh, uh, the church that I pastor now, and we, things took off. We had 92 people show up at our first service. And then uh, today, we have 1,250 people who come. We do five services a weekend. We do two services on Saturday night, three services on Sunday morning. But, you know, I, I tried in one city. People just weren't receptive. It just wasn't working. And so I fine. I said, God, we're going to... We didn't shake our dust off the feet because we weren't mad at those people. But we, we left, and we went to another area where they were receptive, and things took off. Now, later... Uh, another guy went into that same neighborhood where I tried to plant a church and managed to plant a church and grow it to 400. But it just wasn't, I wasn't the right guy in the right place at the right time. Nothing wrong with that. You just have to recognize that. And, you know, if the fish aren't biting, what do you do? You stand there and fish in that same spot all day? No. No. You move, move to where you find where the fish are biting. So growing churches focus on reaching receptive people. Non-growing churches focus on uh, trying to reach inactive uh, people. And so you've got to focus on the most receptive people in your area. And the most receptive people are the ones who are experiencing change. You want to look for those people who are in transition. You know, maybe they've... Uh, the, why our church worked, I believe, is because we got into an area where lots of people were moving in uh, from other cities and other locations. So they were in transition. They were at a new stage in life. They were looking for new friends, looking for uh, new experiences, looking for a new place to go. And so we, that transition was very helpful. Uh, people can be in transition if you've got uh, young people and a lot of them are getting married. Uh, if they're in transition if you're near a college and you've got people who've left home and come to college or people who are graduating college and uh, you're looking for those, those transitions. And then the other ones that are uh, receptive are those under tension. Uh, you look for people who are in those seasons of life when, they're, when there's tension. Man, we're new parents. We, we don't know how to raise a kid. We don't know what to do with a new baby. How do, you, how do you get sleep with a new baby? How do you potty train? How do you discipline? How do you, how do you deal with this new baby? Uh, how do you deal with... with uh, a change in jobs? How do you deal with a, a divorce? Or how do you deal with a death in a family? Uh, how do you deal with now that you've moved? And so you try and find the tension points and the transition points in their life, and that makes people more receptive. Uh, you also want to use the most appropriate hook. Uh, when you go fishing, a different fish like different kinds of food. They respond to different kinds of bait. And so you let your target determine uh, your approach. You, know, you start with where the people are, not with where you want them to be. You know, many times as pastors we think, man, I wish my people would come to this really deep Bible study. I wish they would come to this doctrinal class. I wish they would get into the deep things of the Lord. But that not be, not be where they're at. They may be just struggling with just, you know, how, is there a God? Rather than trying to discover the deep things about God, they don't even know if there is one. Uh, you know, they may be wondering, well, is God even relevant to my life? What, what does it mean for me to be married? What does it mean for me to be a parent? What does it mean for me to be a, a worker? What does it mean uh, that I have cancer, or my wife is ill all the time, or I just lost my parents, and, and now I don't, uh, I don't have them in my life anymore? And so you've got to let the, the needs of your target determine uh, how you're going to reach them. You know, Paul's evangelism strategy was, he says, to the Jews, I became like a Jew to win the Jews in the same way when with the Gentiles, I became like a Gentile in order to win the Gentiles. He says, I have become all things to all men that I may save some of them by any means possible. And I had a, had a guy one time who told me, he says, you know, you're talking about target but Paul says, I became all things to all men. He says, Paul didn't have a target. He was trying to reach everybody. Well, look at the verse. He says, I become all things to all men. But he doesn't say, I become all things to all men all the time. He says, no, I, I identify who it is I'm dealing with and where they're at. And I focus on who they are and what their needs are so that I can save them and reach Christ. 
Paul says, I behave differently when I'm with a Jew than I do if I'm, I'm a Gentile. He says, I behave differently when I'm with someone in the market than when I'm with someone who's in the palace. I behave differently when I'm dealing with sailors than I do when I'm dealing with farmers. You know, he, so I become all things to all men whenever it's appropriate for me as, I, as I'm dealing with them. So as we look at Jesus' standard approach and read through the Gospels, what was his standard approach with evangelism? And we discover that he didn't have one. Jesus always started with the person and with what their need was. You know, he was, he was willing to be flexible and to address. You know, uh, look through the Gospels and see how many times Jesus says, what do you want me to do for you? What do you want? want me to do for you and he met people at their need and that's and that's how he won them and he calls us to do the same thing so in a purpose-driven church our our, uh, evangelism strategy is that we let the needs of unbelievers determine our evangelistic programs and so uh, we we let what are the needs of the people out there in the community and those are the programs that we're going to develop ones that meet the needs Acts 15, God treated the outsiders exactly as he treated us, beginning at the very center of who they were and working from that center outward, cleaning up their lives as they trusted and believed in him. You know, Jesus recognized it's not the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick. I've not come to call the righteous, but sinners. Again, what do you want me to do for you? Jesus started where they were, and sometimes people can be really messy. Sometimes their lives are really messed up. And if we're going to reach them, we've got to start with them where they are. And you, know, you have to catch the fish before you clean them. And in too many of our churches, uh, you know, we don't want people to come until they've gotten cleaned up from the world, you know, until they get some of their problems solved, until they get good enough to come to church that we want to deal with them. But no, you've, you've got to recognize that we have to start with them where they are. Anyone can be one to Christ if you discover the key to his heart. And the key to a person's heart is his needs, his hurts, his questions, his fears, his interests. So before you can share the good news, you, you first of all, you have to capture their attention. And uh, in today's world... Uh, you know, the felt needs of, of most of the unchurched people are emotional and relational needs. They're emotional and relational needs. And the, and the church c- can meet those. You know, too often we think it's physical needs. We think, well, you know, they're, they're sick or they're, they're, uh, they're struggling physically, and so we've got to try and meet those needs. They don't have the right kind of housing they don't have the right kind of transportation. And so as, as the church, and certainly in our evangelistic efforts, we step in and we try and meet all those physical needs. Or, uh, or we may try and meet their economic needs. We think, oh, you know, we just got to throw money at it. That's their biggest problem. They just need more money. And so we try to come up with ways to get more money to them. When, when the reality is their deepest needs are, aren't the physical things. It's not financial. Their deepest needs are on the inside. It's emotional and relational needs. Uh, they, they need to know that God loves them. They need to know that they have value and worth as a person. They need to know that we value them as a person. Uh, they need to know that, that they, they can find peace, that they can find uh, salvation in trusting in Jesus Christ. So those are emotional and relational needs. And next, the mindset of unbelievers determines our strategy. You know, the way we're going to reach them is we, we've got to get them to open their minds and be receptive to the gospel. And so the weapons we use in our fight are not made by human hands. Rather, they are powerful weapons from God. With them, we destroy people's defenses. That is, their arguments. And again, uh, we're going to be wise as serpents, as harmless as doves. Uh, The people of this world are more shrewd in dealing with their own kind than the people of the light. Uh, Again, the average restaurant manager uh, is more savvy, uh, more aware of how to treat people than the average pastor. And so we, we've got to be shrewd in dealing with them. And not in a negative way, but in a very positive way, helping them to understand the gospel. Then the culture of unbelievers determines our evangelistic style. Our evangelistic style. 
uh, whatever a person is like, I try to find common ground with him so that he will let me tell him about Christ and let Christ save him. And so we want to create a style in our, uh, in our um, worship services. We reach out into the community through evangelism and we attract a crowd to come to worship. And so uh, our, the uh, crowd, the, the community that we're trying to reach will determine what kind of worship style we use to try and reach them. And so you have to ask the question, who are you trying to impress? Are you trying to impress all the other Christians around you? Or are you trying to impress uh, the believe, unbelievers that you're trying to reach? So every church caters to some kind of culture. Uh, every church is, uh, is uh, trying to, acting in such a way that they will reach a certain target. But the question is, is will you reach the target that's in your community? Or are you just going to keep doing things the way uh, you've been doing them so you can keep the church people you've already got? You know, are you going to minister to the people who are already in the church and coming to the church, or are you going to try and do things that will match the community outside? Uh, also, the best way to fish, you want to use more than one hook. Uh, you want to offer people options. You want to offer them choices. And that's trot line fishing. Uh, you know, you keep adding hooks to the line, and the more hooks you add, the more fish you can catch. And that's one of the things we discovered in, in our town. If, if all you have is a Sunday morning service in my community, you're telling 30% of your community you can't come to my church. Because 30% of the people in my community work on Sunday morning. So all the nurses, all the people involved in medical care, all the people involved in restaurants, uh, you know, lots of people uh, in, in working shift work, uh, they, they can't come to church because they're not off on Sunday morning. And so when we started a Saturday night service, uh, all of a sudden we found that we had a whole new fishing pond. We had lots of people who could never go to church on Sunday morning, but now they were available on Saturday evening, and so it, it, it started growing. And now our, uh, we have two services on Saturday night. One of them is the second largest of all five of our services. And uh, we've got a whole, uh, whole other group of people, a whole other target that we're reaching because we, we've put those extra, extra hooks in the water. Now the reason we usually fish with only one hook is we ask the wrong question. We, we ask the question, how much will it cost you know, if we're going to start doing things to reach more people, we always ask, how much is it going to cost to do that? But when it comes to evangelism, the question isn't, how much will it cost? The question is, who will it reach? Because we want to be driven by faith, not by finances. And the truth is, is that money spent on evangelism is never an, an expense, it's an investment. You know, as you, as you do these things that reach out into the community and you win people, well, then those people come to the church and then they begin to give, they begin to tithe, and they begin to, uh, to pay for themselves. And so churches never really have money problems, they just have idea problems. You need to think beyond the money and think creatively about what you can do to reach more people. Hudson Taylor, great missionary, um, uh, back in the day, he said, God's work done God's way will not lack God's support. Jesus said, go down to the lake and throw in a line. When you catch your first fish, open its mouth and you will find a coin. Take that coin and go pay the tax for us. And so the, the principle that Jesus is teaching there is, is that the money is always in the mouth of the fish. If your church has money problems, you don't really have money problems. You have evangelism problems. You need to reach more people because the more people that you reach, then uh, God will provide. And, uh, and it'll come through the people. If you focus on fishing, God will pay your bills. You know, one of the purposes of the church, one of the early, first, primary purposes of the church is evangelism. And too many churches stop evangelizing because they get focused on the money. They get focused on how much it's going to cost. And now they've turned the thing upside down. They've made, they've made finances more important than evangelism. And, and God closes the mouth of the fish. The church loses its blessing. 
and now you're, uh, you're headed in a downward spiral. So you want to you wanna keep focused on, uh, on evangelism because that keeps the church fresh, keeps God's blessing pouring in. Uh, number six, you want to fish for the kind of fish that you can best reach. Go after those that you are most likely to reach. And so a couple of questions to, to determine. What kind of people already attend our church? You know, pastor, you just kind of look around and say, okay, who's already here? And uh, because the truth is, is that whatever you're, you're reaching, that's probably what you're going to reach more of. And then you want to ask, what, whoops, what kind of person am I? What kind, because when the pastor matches the church and the church matches the community, then now you've, you've got a real formula for church growth. But if the, if the church doesn't match the community, and if the pastor doesn't match the church, then, then, then now things aren't working, things are out of sync. That was my problem with that first church I planted. I really didn't match that community. That's why I, didn't, I wasn't very successful. The next guy that came in, he was a match. And things exploded for him. And he quickly grew to 200, then to 400 people. And so you've got to ask yourself, who can I, can I best reach? Uh, because I can best reach the people that I can relate to. And you're going to attract what you are, not what you want. Okay? Truth is, just selfishly in the flesh, being very transparent with you, I would love to pastor a church full of millionaires. Okay? Yeah, I'd love to pastor, but I'm not a millionaire. And so that's just not going to happen. So what do I pastor? I pastor a church full of just a bunch of middle class guys like me that are raising their family and just schlepping along through life. Okay? And those are the people that God's called me to reach. And, and because that's who I am. And so I just need to recognize that. But there are some options. You may be thinking about this and you may think, well, you know, I'm not sure that I match my church. I'm not sure that my church matches the community. What, what do we do? Well, first, you build on your strengths. You know, your church is there. You've obviously reached some people. And there are probably more people there like the people that you've reached. And so if God's called you to, to minister there then you just stay there and you build on your strengths. And, um, uh, you know, you just keep doing what you're doing. And uh, number two, you can reinvent your congregation. And this is uh, something that can happen fairly easily if you're small. If you have a small congregation, you know, you lose one or two families and you pick up one or two other families, you can change the, the dynamic, you can change the culture uh, of a small church uh, pretty quickly. It's not easy, but it can be done. The third thing that you can do is you can start new congregations to reach new groups of people. You know, maybe it's time for your church to, to have a baby church, to plant a church, create a sister church. You know, if you've got a church that's, that's, that's full of uh, senior citizens, and they're not interested in making any changes. They love the traditions that they've had for years. It's going to be really hard, really difficult for them to make those changes. Well, that's fine. They can stay that way, but encourage them. Well, then would you be interested in, in helping to start a church that's going to reach people uh, who are, are different than you, who are, you reach people who are uh, interested in, in a different worship style than you have? And so you start another congregation, uh, that matches the new groups that you're trying to reach. So your first steps to take in targeting your community. Number one, you need to probe. You need to learn all you can about your area. You've got to ask questions. You want to uh, get serious about knowing uh, what, what the people in your community are like. And then you partition. You just divide your community into, into people groups. You get a, an understanding of this is how many uh, senior citizens there are, this is how many middle-aged people there are, this is how many uh, young couples there are, this is what the college kids look like, this is how many teens and kids there are, you know, this is how many people are uh, uh, financially well-to-do, well-educated, this is how many people are just uh, middle uh, managers, this is how many, many people are not very learned, maybe just working in the trades. And then you decide... Well, which one of those people groups are we going to go for? 
Again, you're not being exclusive. You're not saying the other people can't come. But you're saying, which ones can we most effectively reach? And you identify that target. And then you become or you create the kind of church that will speak uh, to that group. Uh, I, I have found just in my own ministry that it has really helped me to have a clear sense uh, of a target. Uh, to be able to uh, plan my sermons, to be able to plan our programs, to plan our services. And, uh, but, but I've also been amazed, as we've done that, at the diverse crowd that we've been able to attract. But we've been effective because we've, uh, we've been very intentional about creating the target. You love everybody, but you fish for the ones that you think you can catch. Uh, 